Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon to our listeners and uh, participants from the from Europe and the Middle East. And good evening to those of you who are tuning in uh, from Asia. Uh, I'm David Gordon, senior fellow, uh, senior advisor for geoeconomics and strategy uh, at the IISS, and welcome to today's session workshop uh, on uh, Western responses to China's Belt and Road Initiative. So this is a, uh, uh, a, a test for us here uh, at IISS as we, as we try to work in this world of opening up uh, after the pandemic. We, we have about 20 people or so here uh, in our office. Others are joining virtually. Uh, uh, we have two of our participants here with us. We have two uh, calling in, uh, one from, are you in London or are, are you in Manama, Maya? Still in London, David, heading out on Thursday. Okay, so we have, we have my colleague, Maya Nowens, calling in from London. Maya is Senior Fellow for China Defense Policy and Military Modernization at IISS. And on the side, uh, she is a lead researcher as well uh, on our work on the BRI, doing very, very substantial uh, empirical work on looking at the extent of Chinese investments overseas uh, and, and also one of our leading analysts of Ch China's um, digital s Silk Road. So welcome. Maya, let me also welcome my old friend and colleague Tatsuya Terazawa, who is joining us from Tokyo. Uh, uh, Terazawa-san is chair and CEO of the Institute uh, of Energy Economics uh, in Japan. Uh, he is a former vice minister uh, at METI uh, and really cr created the economic security staff on Japan's uh, national security staff in the cabinet office in Tokyo. Joining me here in Washington are David Sachs to my immediate left, who uh, is a research fellow here in DC uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, where he's just completed a major project on China's BRI. Uh, and to my far left is Nick Crawford uh, from IISS London, who is a research associate uh, in geoeconomics and strategy. Uh, and Nick has been part of our core team uh, and is a major author in our upcoming strategic dossier uh, that we will be um, publishing uh, in the next several months uh, at IISS, looking at China's Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, so for those of you who are tuning in virtually, uh, uh, you will be able to pose questions uh, uh, on by by writing them in uh, on your on your video screen. Uh, I will I will uh, take those qu questions and include them uh, in the Q and A portion of our session today. Uh, what I want to start with, though, uh, is asking each of our participants uh, what has been the response so far uh, by Western countries 
to the BRI. Uh, and let me pose that question to David for the United States, to Tetsuya for Japan, to Nick uh, for the UK uh, and the EU, and then uh, Maya, uh, if I could ask you to, to respond to, to that uh, in terms of the Western response to the digital Silk Road dimension of BRI, that would be great. Three or four minutes, uh, and uh, let me start with you, David. Sure, so thanks, David, for, uh, for having me and for having this uh, discussion on Belt and Road. So on the US response, I think it's really interesting when we look back, given how much BRI is dominating the discourse now, that really there was no response from 2013 until maybe 2017 or so, that the full scope of BRI was not clear, the digital Silk Road was only added later. Um, there wasn't really evidence of, for instance, uh, issues with debt sustainability or potentially you know, environmental sustainability issues. And, and what's really interesting is that even in 2017, you had Matt Pottinger from the Trump administration go to the Belt and Road Forum in Beijing, which was interpreted as kind of the US blessing BRI in principle and saying that the US was open to collaborating and working with China on BRI. But that quickly shifted in late 2017 and 2018. And here, I think a key event in at least the narrative surrounding BRI in the West was the Hambantota port in Sri Lanka, where in December 2017, uh, Sri Lanka signs it away for 99 years to the Chinese because it couldn't repay the debt on that port. Now, looking at it as uh, part of the debt trap narrative or as revealing the true nature of BRI is problematic, I think, and we can talk about why that is the case uh, later in the panel. But basically after that, you have Mike Pence go to APEC um, in 2018, and he describes Belt and Road as a constricting belt and a one-way road. Uh, Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo then echoes similar language, John Bolton, rails against Belt and Road. Uh, even the commander of US Indo-PACOM uh, talks about the security implications of the Belt and Road and why that uh, is counter to US interests. So what drove that? I talked a little bit about the debt sustainability um, questions that we had with BRI. There was also, I think, frustration that BRI wasn't really open to foreign companies, that it was extremely difficult for US companies to, to win contracts or even bid on contracts. It was all very opaque, lack transparency. Also major uh, issues with China's export of coal-fired power plants along BRI. So I think that the kind of narrative um, the, the took hold of the assessment, if you will, is that in theory, BRI could have been a good thing. It could have contributed to global economic growth and, and helped fill a real infrastructure gap. But in practice, the way that BRI was being implemented by China, the risks greatly uh, outweighed any potential benefits. So what has been the US response to date? So the Trump administration did do a few things to, to explicitly respond to BRI. I think the most uh, the most important one was the establishment of the Development Finance Corporation, uh, which was given $60 billion to make these investments, again, led by the private sector, though, partnering with the private sector in developing mark uh, in, in the developing world. Also, the Exim Bank, which kind of had become a political football in the United States, that was given a seven-year authorization. And then towards the end of the Trump administration, the uh, content requirements were relaxed so that Exim Bank could do more to compete with, with BRI. Uh, there was, of course, a, uh, a pressure on Huawei uh, in recognition that China was really using the digital Silk Road to push Huawei 5G around the world. And so we, we all know about the, uh, the, the, the export controls on chips that go to Huawei. The Trump administration also uh, introduced a clean network initiative and a clean cable initiative to kind of um, try to incentivize countries to move away from Huawei. And then there was also something called the Blue Dot uh, Network, which was a 
projects between Australia, the United States and Japan to basically try to create a certification system for infrastructure projects around the world. Um, to, to look at projects and make it apply for basically the blue dot seal of approval that it was economically, environmentally uh, sustainable. And the hope in the United States was that that would then uh, incentivize or de-risk investments for the private sector. So the Biden administration, interestingly, has actually run with Blue Dot Network so much that it inherited from the Trump administration, it has uh, discarded. But actually, Secretary of State Blinken in Paris recently had a whole panel about the Blue Dot Network. It is now embedded within the OECD and, we, and the US is working with the OECD to set the technical parameters for certifying infrastructure projects. And then the final thing, and this is probably where we'll spend a lot of the time this morning is the Build Back Better World initiative, which President Biden rolled out at the G7 over the summer um, and which he then highlighted again in, in Glasgow at COP26. Uh, and that really focuses on four pillars or four areas where the US arguably has a comparative advantage over China, and that's climate, health, digital technologies, and gender equality. But again, this isn't trying to imitate Belt and Road. It's really trying to offer a private sector uh, alternative to Belt and Road. Um, and there are questions I think about implementation of what's now known as B3W and Blue Dot Network, but uh, we can get into that maybe a little later. Thank you very much, uh, David. Let me turn to Tara Zalasan. Uh, you know, when I look at Western responses to BRI, I think a lot of them were actually initiated and, and articulated uh, first by Japan. So. Uh, Talk to us about Japan's response to BRI. Well, well thank you very much, David. Uh, it's an honor for myself to be able to participate in this panel um, because Japan is located nearby China and the main uh, uh, theater for BRI was in Asia. And uh, we were in competition with China for many infrastructure projects. So compared with the US, as David described, uh, Japan uh, did respond uh, to uh, BRI, BRI much earlier than the U.S. Uh, it goes back to at least 2015 or earlier in, in that regard. And just to give you a quick overview of our response, um, let me uh, summarize our response in four pillars. The first pillar is to uh, promote the uh, concept of quality infrastructure. Uh, the quality infrastructure, what, what we mean is that stressing life cycle cost over the immediate apparent cost. It may be cheap at the beginning, but it can be expensive over time. Uh, we also, uh, in quality infrastructure, stressing the uh, concept of debt sustainability, uh, as David mentioned. And also, uh, we are stressing uh, environment sustainability. And these principles for quality infrastructure was endorsed were endorsed at the G20 summit meeting in Osaka, which was hosted by Japan in 2019. The second pillar is capacity building, uh, because um, even if we come up with the concept, if the developing countries do not understand quality infrastructure, or if they cannot make the sound judgment whether it is consistent with quality infrastructure or not, it will be meaningless. Uh, so capacity building has been another area of focus for us. Uh, additionally, uh, we believe that it is important to um, provide capacity building, capacity building for the developing countries so that they can protect themselves against uh, risky one-sided uh, contracts, uh, in many cases pushed through the BRI. The third pillar of our response was to provide a credible alternatives, uh, especially through providing the finance. Um, we expanded uh, the budget uh, so that we can provide financing for infrastructure project, projects as early as in 2015. Um, we strengthened the equity basis for many of the government affiliated financial institutions in 2015 and 2016. And also we reformed many uh, uh, policy tools we had to support infrastructure developments to make them more flexible and speedy. The fourth um, pillar 
is, is rather more realistic or pragmatic. Um, since we realize that we cannot compete with every project under BRI, we simply do not have the resources to match them. So we prioritize uh, the sectors or areas in which we would uh, be focusing on. And uh, I would just say two uh, major areas. One area is uh, are the sectors which we believe have significant security implications. Um, to be more specific, like seaports, uh, number two, ICT infrastructure, telecommunication infrastructure, including submarine cables and the 5G or 4G uh, networks, and also um, energy infrastructure, such as uh, LNG-related infrastructure. Those are the um, infrastructure. We believe that there are more security concerns compared with other infrastructure. So for these infrastructure, we pay a special attention to uh, to ensure that um, uh, we can compete with uh, the Chinese in those projects. Additionally, uh, the second category of the areas is much more commercial. Uh, we focus on areas in which uh, we continue to have competitiveness, such as subways, uh, high-speed trains, and also power generation. Uh, so what about the other sectors, like road building? Uh, frankly, uh, roads are not as security concern, does not, do not necessarily have the security concerns as uh, compared with the seaports. And frankly, we do not have the competitiveness in road building. So for those areas, um, generally speaking, we do not participate. So we are focusing our uh, resources uh, on areas we think uh, are important and also areas in which we, we can reasonably win. So these have been the uh, four pillars of our responses to BRI. Uh, we continue to pay a strong interest on, on, on BRI and in our competition with the Chinese companies and also the security implications of BRI. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Tara Zawasan. Nick, Europe and the UK. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, well, <clears throat> like David said, with respect to the US, <clears throat> there's been quite a change uh, in the EU's perspective and response to uh, the BRI over time. Um, even more so than the US, the EU was quite relaxed about uh, the Belt and Road Initiative in its early years. In fact, <clears throat> it was quite keen to collaborate with China on various aspects of the initiative. Um, particularly on the aspect of connectivity between Europe and Asia. I mean, the reality was that very little happened in this area. There were some memoranda of understanding between European development banks and the uh, Chinese uh, development banks, the Exim Bank and China Development Bank, but very little actually happened. In fact, really the, the one notable collaboration in terms of financing between the EU uh, and China or rather between a European country and China has actually taken place this year. And that's between France and China who are jointly funding and developing the Metro in Belgrade and Serbia. And there's also been quite a lot of Sino-French cooperation at a business level too. Nevertheless, uh, in, these initial, uh, in these initial years, the spirit was one much more of collaboration and cooperation. Having said that, and this is another point of uh, more of a point of difference from the US, the BRI is actually sort of present in Europe. Um, there are, or there were, um, well, there is the uh, China Central and Eastern Europe uh, Cooperation Framework, which had 17 members, but Lithuania is now left, so it now has 16 members. And then there are a number of other European countries who are participating as well. And that created a slightly different set of concerns uh, for the EU uh, than, than for the US perhaps. Uh, one is that within its domestic market, Europe was concerned about China tilting the playing field in favor of its companies in, in infrastructure building. Um, so worried about distortion of European norms around procurement, for example. But the other aspect and perhaps more important was a concern that China's influence through the Belt and Road Initiative uh, turned into political influence in European decision-making. So for example, at the European Commission, uh, uh, there was, um, sorry, actually the European Council, there was 
a watering down of positions on the uh, South China Sea, uh, on human rights in China, uh, because of the voting behavior of countries that were receiving a lot of money from China. So since 2018, so a similar kind of time frame there, uh, to the US, there's been more of a thrust towards competing with the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, in November of that year, the EU set out its EU's Asia connectivity strategy. And then in October last year, 2020, there was a new EU investment plan for the Western Balkans, which was the region of Europe that had really received the most in terms of BRI funding. And it's, it's tried to compete with China's offer within Europe. And now, of course, we have the Global Gateway Initiative, and that's the centerpiece of the EU's response now to the BRI. And the timing of our discussion today is perhaps a little bit unfortunate because it looks like the details of that initiative will be announced tomorrow. <laughs> um, but some of the details, uh, the draft details are known. So Global Gateway expects to provide about 40 billion in investment guarantees. Now, it's not clear yet over what period, but probably up until 2027, which is the end of the EU's current budgeting period. And then there'll be an unspecified amount in grants. Um, it's not clear how much of that is new money and how much of it is just rebadged, um, because under the EU's external investment plan for this budgeting cycle, they'd already spoken about 60 billion in investment guarantees. So this is actually 50% less. Now, whether that's because of timing or, or because of a scaling back, uh, it, it's not really clear. To put this 40 billion in investment guarantees into a bit of perspective, the multilateral investment guarantee agency, which is part of the World Bank, disperses about four and a half billion dollars. Uh, so I guess what, somewhere between three and a half and four billion euros per year in investment guarantees. So what the EU is promising looks to be more than what the um, what MIGA is promising, um, but it's hard to compare with what China is doing because investment guarantees aren't really the core of BRI financing. Uh, you can't really compare with investment because there's lots of investment that doesn't get investment guarantees. But just to give you a little bit of a sense, uh, last year, 2020, which was obviously lower than previous years, uh, China. Uh, provided 46 billion US dollars in greenfield foreign direct investment. So sort of uh, investments in new companies or new projects or new joint ventures, 70 billion the year before that. So, but it's really hard to compare. So how will this 40 billion be spent? Well, the EU wants to support projects in five sectors, the digital transition. So that mirrors the digital Silk Road. The clean energy transition, which sort of mirrors a little bit the green belt and road aspect of BRI. Transport, like the more traditional BRI projects. People-to-people uh, -people connections, again, a long-standing aspect of the BRI and it's almost adopting uh, Chinese terminology there. And then trade and resilient supply chains, which is an interesting, potentially, new area of collaboration. It'd be interesting to know more about what the EU plans in that area. It's also very ambitious in scope. It's not focusing on the EU's direct neighborhood. Uh, it spans Europe, Africa, Central Asia, the Indo-Pacific, Latin America, and apparently the Arctic. So it's trying to cover every region touched by the BRI, except maybe the Middle East. Um, it says that the emphasis will be on different sectors in different regions, which makes sense. But as you can see, the global gateway looks quite reactive, even if the, the way of providing financing is different from China. Before I hand over, I should mention the UK. Uh, some of you may remember that the British government was plugging something called the Clean Green Initiative in the lead up to the G7, which it hosted earlier this year. Uh, the government wanted the Clean Green Initiative to be the joint G7 response to the BRI. In the end, the G7 adopted the US label, Build Back Better Well Together. Um, but since then, it seems any aspirations for a truly joint initiative have fallen a bit by the wayside. 
But the Clean Green Initiative is back. It's now the title of the UK's response to the Belt and Road Initiative. And the uh, UK government announced it at COP26, again, hosted in the UK this year. That involves three billion pounds in financing over five years for sustainable infrastructure and green technology. And then it's also providing investment guarantees to the African Development Bank and the World Bank for projects in Africa and India, respectively. One last thing, I think it's worth flagging. Something else was announced at COP26, and that was the US, EU, and the UK coming together to form the Just Energy Transition Partnership for South Africa. And they've promised $8.5 billion through that partnership to help South Africa move away from coal. I think that's quite an interesting template for how the Global Gateway, the B3W initiative, uh, and others like the UK, Japan, uh, perhaps even China, uh, might coordinate their initiatives a bit more in future, though they look completely uncoordinated at, at the moment. Great, thank you very much. Now, yeah, let's turn to the digital Silk Road, because I think uh, there it's, it's quite a different story. Yes, thanks, David, um, and thanks for having me on the panel today. It's a great uh, and timely event, as Nick stated. Um, you're right to say that the story on the digital Silk Road is a little bit different than what we've seen in the BRI, uh, namely, of course, because uh, the digital Silk Road uh, came about a little bit later, uh, officially entered into Chinese uh, BRI-related documentation around 2015, but it wasn't really until 2018, uh, as uh, David stated, that we saw a more organized uh, effort to counter uh, the concerns that were uh, arisen around uh, Chinese uh, digital investments and tech rollouts, uh, both in the West and abroad. And of course, um, how the West responded to the digital Silk Road has two elements to it, both uh, internally, domestically, how the West responded to the digital Silk Road and Chinese tech rollouts uh, and presence at home, uh, and secondly, uh, how uh, the, uh, the West responded to the digital Silk Road's uh, global uh, presence. So with regards to the first, I think we can see that um, overwhelmingly, the focus on the digital Silk Road and pushback to it was focused centrally on the 5G issue uh, and network security. Um, and there were three main responses within uh, the West. Uh, first of all, there were governments that aligned very quickly, of course, with the United States that we saw primarily uh, within the Five Eyes intelligence uh, sharing network, uh, with exclusion, of course, of the UK initially, uh, plus countries like Japan, of course, as well. Now, the UK was an exception to this rule. It had uh, originally uh, deemed that the risks around uh, using Huawei in its 5G national network could be mitigated, of course, following supply chain issues to Huawei and restrictions of advanced uh, uh, technological components to uh, China, uh, the UK overturned its decision, stating that it can no longer um, rely on Huawei to uh, fulfill the guarantee of long-term quality of its products and services. So it's gone uh, the other way and joined the United States and the Five Eyes in Japan. The second group of countries are countries that uh, I think represent the overwhelming uh, group of uh, responses within the West. And those are countries that were hesitant to decide one way or another very quickly obviously uh, having uh, heavy debates internally about the trade-offs between prosperity and security. And these countries, I think, um, responded in two different ways. There were first uh, a group of countries who slowly but surely uh, passed national legislation targeted at preventing uh, at-risk vendors, but not perhaps directly naming Huawei or Chinese companies. So I think here, for example, of France, Italy, Finland, and most recently Germany. And then there's on the other hand countries who didn't pass any legislation nationally and instead left it to national telecommunications providers to make the right choice uh, to exclude uh, um, Chinese uh, or other at-risk vendors um, uh, by themselves. And these, for example, include the Netherlands, uh, which in one case uh, has excluded uh, Huawei, but in other national telecommunications networks still includes it in its 5G testing uh, and other case countries such as Portugal. Now, there are a third set of countries, of course, within the West that are completely different and that haven't taken any decision on Huawei or, uh, in fact, have decided to continue with Huawei for their national 5G networks. 
Uh, and here we can think of, for example, Hungary, but also Austria, Switzerland, and Ireland. Now, strikingly, as I said, the response within Europe and within the West was uh, overwhelmingly focused on the issue of 5G. But the important thing about the digital Silk Road is that it is perhaps surprisingly, if we can say that, more nebulous than the Belt and Road Initiative in a number of ways. Uh, one, of course, in its geographic scope, and second of all, in its technological scope. And here, of course, uh, is the important issue that the digital Silk Road isn't just about Huawei and it isn't just about 5G. It's about satellite uh, infrastructure. It's about data centers, smart cities, security uh, information systems like safe cities and surveillance related technologies, about e-commerce platforms, fintech platforms, e-governments, and of course, importantly, submarine cables and fiber optic overland cables as well. And so in these spaces, we actually saw Western countries take very limited responses uh, to the digital Silk Road in its entirety, perhaps with the exclusion of, for example, uh, submarine cable limitations as uh, Tatsuya-san has, uh, has stated importantly. Um, the West also, of course, within Europe, for example, and within uh, some NATO allied countries, uh, enhanced its investment screening mechanisms to be able to counter uh, Chinese digital investments or investments in critical national infrastructure related to technology. Um, but I can talk a little bit more about the uh, efficacy of some of those investment screening mechanisms uh, in our next section. Now abroad, of course, the West focused on um, uh, requesting allies and partners, like-minded states to uh, switch from Huawei or to exclude Huawei, uh, to champion uh, our alternatives to Huawei within the uh, digital uh, physical infrastructure space, and those being, of course, uh, Japanese companies, but importantly, Nokia and Ericsson within Europe. Uh, and of course, there's been an effort through a number of different initiatives that have already been mentioned by the panel, and I won't go into them, uh, on uh, the importance of uh, digital standards uh, as well. Um, there's been a mixed bag of results, uh, but I know that might be coming up in our discussion a little bit, so uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, just to note, that uh, overwhelmingly the result uh, within non-Western countries has not been uh, the exact same as in within Western countries when it comes to uh, the exclusion of Chinese tech. Thank you very much, Maya. Uh, so let me do one more round uh, with our um, presenters and then we will open up the floor to questions. So what I'd like each of you to focus on is sort of how do you assess the, the impact of the response so far uh, to BRI by the West? Uh, and what should the response be? Uh, so it's more uh, analytic and prescriptive. Uh, and and let, me, let me start uh, he, here with, with Surya. Well, I would have to say that um, um, with our efforts together with other countries, um, we certainly have made some meaningful impacts. Uh, in particular, um, many Asian countries have learned uh, the uh, risks or the problems associated with, with BRI projects. Uh, there are a large number of uh, examples, but uh, one example I may mention is that um, for the high-speed railway uh, project in Indonesia, uh, we lost against China, I think it was 2015 or so, um, and Chinese at the time made the promise that they will complete the project by 2019, and Japan said that we, we could no we could, we could never be able to complete the project by 2019. But China made that promise. And number two, China said that there will be no uh, burden on the Indonesian government for this project. And uh, the Japanese said that it's, it's, it's not realistic. Uh, the uh, Indonesian government would have to pay some money to have this project. But because the Chinese made those two promises, the Indonesian government uh, uh, took the uh, Chinese project. Uh, but as of now, to the best of my knowledge, the, the project is far from being completed. And the Indonesian government has been forced to put uh, a sizable amount of uh, government funding to that project. So um, I, I think um, as we um, promote the idea of, uh, of, of quality infrastructure or build-out network or whatever, 
I, I think through that sort of educational process, um, a, a large number of uh, developing countries, especially in Asia, are now learning uh, the risk associated with BRI related projects. So it's a big uh, progress in that regard. Um, we have also made a number of progress in the uh, collaboration among like-minded countries. I, I cannot come up with all, but we have had the US-Japan partnership, US-Japan, Australia uh, partnership, and the Quad, including India. And also we had a bilateral uh, sort of co collaboration with the EU and also with the UK. So there are so many MOUs or statements uh, stressing the alliance or cooperation among like-minded countries uh, to put forward a, a good the quality infrastructure vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Chinese infrastructure. So many, many documents, but uh, frankly, um, if we look at tangible uh, projects uh, which have been uh, under cooperation by, by those uh, three, four, five players, it, it's hard to find um, a number of them. Um, one of the possible exceptions is the um, submarine cable project uh, 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 connecting Palau uh, it is a branch of the uh, Trans-Pacific uh, uh, submarine cable connecting the U.S. and Singapore, but but probably that will be probably the only uh, concrete, uh, tangible project in which uh, Japan, the U.S., and Australia actually cooperated in making uh, a project real. So, um, so mixed results, um, uh, better understanding by the developing countries. Uh, many, many MOUs among uh, for cooperation, but uh, very limited on uh, tangible results so far. That's a quick uh, response to your question. Thank you. And and uh, maybe I, sh I should uh, answer what sh we should be doing, or, or yes, is please. that the next question? Yes. <laughs> no, what, what should we be doing? Well, um, there are many, many things that we should be doing, <laughs> but just to be quick. Uh, number one, uh, China is not participating in probably any of the global framework uh, governing uh, infrastructure development. The only possible exception is their participation in DSSI, the Debt Service yes. Suspension Initiative yes. uh, in response to COVID-19. But even with that, um, the 100% owned Chinese uh, Development Bank is not participating, claiming that is in the private sector. Uh, China is not part of the Paris Club. And in many of the uh, contracts, we find um, no Paris Club clause, which explicitly uh, denies the possibility that China would join the Paris uh, Court, Paris Club uh, agreement in those projects. Um, we have OECD export credit guidelines, which governs the uh, competition uh, for financing. China uh, is not a part. Uh, we have had discussion with China to join uh, in the IWG process, but it is nine years since we started this process and it is going nowhere. So I think uh, the US, Europe, uh, Japan, UK uh, would have to urge uh, China uh, as a responsible member of the global community that they would have to join in those great global frameworks if uh, they want to play uh, in the global, um, uh, global field. Uh, the second thing is that um, one of the strengths of the Western side is the private financial sector. Um, the power of the, uh, the finance sector and the private sector. Um, I think David and uh, Nick mentioned the uh, guarantees and guarantees are powerful tools to reduce the risk for the uh, financial sector from the private sector to join. Um, it's excellent, but, um, uh, be, and also uh, the blue dot network, if they come up with any certification mechanism, it may be helpful uh, to direct the uh, private uh, financing to uh, be uh, BDN, Blue Dot Network certified um, uh, projects. Um, but additionally, um, I think it is important that, that now uh, the private sector, financial sector in the Western countries are so much interested in climate financing. Um, they believe that they are in support of SDGs goals. But um, SDG goals is not just about environment. It has 17 goals. It's not just environment. Uh, it has uh, development, uh, the healthcare, and so on, uh, and, and creation of jobs, and so on. So 
And those concepts are in line with the quality infrastructure uh, concepts I described. So um, I think the Western uh, countries and Western institutions have been successful in mobilizing the financial sector money to uh, guide uh, the financing and investment uh, for the global climate issue. Um, but with that success, if we can stretch uh, that success to cover a broader SDG goals, including uh, uh, the uh, quality uh, infrastructure, I think it will be very powerful. Uh, we cannot match China with their government money, but uh, with this huge private sector money, if we can guide and lead that money uh, for, for these kind of a better, good uh, infrastructure, uh, I think it will be powerful. So those are Thank the two very quick, much. Uh, answers to the should be questions. Great. David, so we've got the US DFI now. What, uh, when's it gonna really hit the ground? Yeah, I mean, I think that just speaking more generally about the US response yeah. to date, I mean, we're, we're really still in the early stages, um, but I think that the, the positive shift we've seen is that we've gone from just criticizing BRI, saying don't take Chinese money, it's really bad for you, to actually offering an affirmative agenda and alternatives to BRI. Because I think where we fell flat is basically saying to countries in desperate need of infrastructure, don't take this money, but we have nothing to offer you. So we've really been trying to figure out how we can offer an alternative. And, and as David said, we now have the DFC, Exim Bank has more flexibility and they're making good investments. Um, the US has also started offering technical support. I think, uh, you know, the, the showcase there is with Myanmar, where the US basically looked at a contract that it had negotiated with the Chinese and, and was able to highlight all the inflated costs and Myanmar was able to negotiate that down. So I think technical support to BRI countries is a very cost effective thing that we can do. And I would also say that I think our public messaging on the risks of BRI um, as was just highlighted, helped countries realize uh, maybe some aspects that they hadn't been thinking about. But it also, I think, uh, forced China to change some of its BRI practices. So China introduced the Green Belt and Road. And that was after a lot of criticism about, uh, about funding uh, coal-fired power plants abroad. And then we had Xi Jinping at UNGA in September saying China will no longer support coal-fired power plants abroad. So I do think that uh, our messaging has gotten through to the Chinese in some respect and has actually shaped BRI in a, in a somewhat positive uh, direction, or at least better than what it was before. Um, and just to pick up on the last, uh, the, the last point, I mean, I think that the main hurdle that we see now in the West is that our response is going to rely primarily on the private sector, but our private capital and our institutional investors, they really don't play in this space, right? They don't really invest in infrastructure. And it's not uh, an asset class, so to speak, and it's not something that they can securitize and trade among each other. And infrastructure has a very long time horizon to realize uh, returns. And so therefore, it's not inherently uh, attractive. So what, we're, so what the US is hoping to do, I think, with Blue Dot Network um, and with Build Back Better World is to kind of de-risk this investment for institutional investors and to really try to develop infrastructure as an asset class so that they don't have to do a lot of thinking about, is this investable? Uh, will I make my money back? And they can kind of treat it the way they treat lots of other assets around the world. And, and but again, you know, build back better world, we don't know what resources it will have. That hasn't been announced yet. They haven't identified any projects. Uh, reports are that US officials are kind of going around the world looking for projects uh, for potentially an initial 50 investments under the B3W framework. But um, really, uh, as was just mentioned, we're, we're kind of in the phase of signing a lot of communiques, agreeing to shared principles, but we haven't really actually hit the ground running yet. I had a discussion last week with a very senior U.S. financial official on this who, who said that they hope to announce at least a half dozen specific projects by January. Yeah. So we'll see if that happens. Maya. Thanks, David. Um, 
Well, I mean, in terms of the impact that the Western uh, response has had in Europe, I've already talked about uh, the landscape that we see in Europe at the moment, but perhaps it's more interesting to talk a little bit more about the landscape that we see outside of uh, the West as well. And here, I think the competition uh, over 5G shows that Huawei is still very much in the game, uh, I would say. So at the AAAS, we're uh, currently conducting a mapping project. We've actually completed it, but are uh, finalizing the platform that it will be uh, hosted on. Uh, that maps, uh, as David uh, mentioned, the Digital Silk Road and the Belt and Road Initiative across various strands. Um, and the Digital Silk Road element of that shows that actually uh, to date, only roughly 20% of existing 5G projects have been halted or officially canceled. So um, I would say uh, still in the minority. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, where these uh, cancellations and halts have taken place are overwhelmingly in the West or uh, like-minded countries. So even here, um, I think uh, the developing world, uh, developing economies um, are still very much looking towards China for uh, that uh, cheap and quick uh, technological rollout that, that the DSR promises. Now, with regards to um, the West's ability to um, supply like for like uh, uh, digital rollouts um, in order to offer alternatives, we've seen some movement here. Um, of course, I think kind of uh, portrayed as a, um, as a, as a key uh, moment and, and, and shift in how the, how the West was able to compete with Huawei was uh, the 5G and national network tender in Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia, of course, being traditionally uh, very reliant, if not entirely reliant, on Chinese uh, telecommunications uh, technology. Um, here, uh, Vodafone, backed by the United States and the UK uh, financially, won a tender for the new telecoms network uh, against South Africa's MTN, which is backed by, uh, by uh, Chinese uh, funders, of course. Um, so Chinese funder, Chinese technology companies will now be excluded from that network in the advanced uh, generations of telecommunications. Uh, similarly, Ericsson and Nokia are slowly starting to expand and replace Huawei in certain uh, networks. But again, these are very much like-minded networks. Think, for example, of Taiwan, of uh, Singapore, and of Vietnam. Um, overwhelmingly, that expansion and that replacement of Huawei, I think, has been very, very slow to date. Um, and in submarine cable networks, I would just add one more uh, uh, example here. In addition to uh, the, the uh, Pacific uh, cable that was mentioned previously, um, uh, of course, NEC, a Japanese company, uh, beat Huawei in a tender to, uh, to build and roll out the submarine cable network connecting Australia, New Zealand, and Chile most recently. However, I think one thing that the Pacific Cable Network uh, highlighted very interestingly is local agency in a lot of these projects. And we talk here a lot, uh, and we have across the panel, talked a lot about our responses in the West, and we've talked a lot about Chinese responses, but we focus very little on the dynamics internally in countries that are recipients of BRI and DSR. I think that's extremely important. And what we saw in that cable uh, offer that was made by uh, the US, Australia, and Japan first in 2018 was that Papua New Guinea officials turned around and said, well, the fact that you uh, offered this cable at the 11th hour when we're halfway through our project with Huawei is a little bit uh, patronizing, uh, and you could have come with this offer a lot earlier, so we'll stick with Huawei. Now that, of course, was in the end overturned. Um, but I think it goes just to show that the way that we approach these uh, projects is really important. And here, I draw concern with uh, working only with like-minded countries, so seemingly forming a club around this uh, and excluding countries that perhaps aren't like-minded uh, in some of the areas around digital governance. Um, second of all, I think with regards to where we can do better, um, we need to perhaps not just think about alternatives and providing like-for-like like. that will be slow. I don't think we can do that quick enough to compete with China across the board in the digital Silk Road. So perhaps here we need to, again, focus more on those technical training and education uh, uh, provisions that we could make around uh, digital economies that would be useful at a local and at a national level. Uh, and here, for example, think about um, leveraging our expertise in things like cybersecurity as well, or um, supporting civil society on some of these issues abroad uh, too. 
Uh, and lastly, I think one thing that will uh, perhaps continue to be a sticking point in our ability as the West to uh, move forward on this is our own disagreements on uh, within the transatlantic relationship on things like uh, technology and digital privacy um, uh, issues and governance as well. So here, um, there's lots to do at home, but there's also lots of different ways that we could be involved abroad. Thank you very much, Mayor. Nick. Thank you, David. <clears throat> I think it's worth um, uh, stepping back briefly. If we're talking about how successful the EU's response is, well, what are they trying to respond to? What has BRI actually achieved? And, and what is the EU trying to achieve? Europe and, and also other countries too. I mean, for China, I think the BRI has done three main things. One, it has helped China become a more influential economic player in many regions of the world. I mean, to be clear, through trade, it would have been very influential anyway, uh, but through investment and lending and providing affordable technologies to developing countries, it's more influential than it would otherwise be. And in somewhere uh, like uh, much of Africa, now I think there's a, a mentality of needing to balance China and the US. So these are the two poles, which kind of demonstrates how much China has achieved in that regard. Secondly, the BRI has been a vehicle for Beijing's industrial strategy outside China. As we've all seen, the Beijing has regularly added new strands to the BRI. It started with physical infrastructure uh, and exporting excess capacity and its uh, heavy manufacturing industry. It then added the Digital Silk Road, as, as Mayor said in 2015. It added the Green Belton Road and the Health Silk Road in 2017. And since then, uh, in 2019, it widened further to look at aligning partner countries' standards and norms with China's. So the BRI has been used also to support China's uh, own industrial strategy. And, and thirdly, and relatedly, in infrastructure around the world, it's, it's tilted the playing field in, the favor of, uh, in, in China's favor in big public projects, giving Chinese firms a commercial advantage. So then what does the EU want to achieve in response to all of that? Well, firstly, I think it wants to go some way to counterbalance China's influence. Um, and not only that, I think the EU has been explicit about wanting to be a third major player in the digital sector, for example, and, and next to the US and China. So I think there's something more also about the EU wanting almost to be a third pole. So how well does the EU's response so far achieve that? I mean, the Global Gateway is a, is a good first step. I mean, it gives a stronger brand to what the EU is already doing, but it's not clear that the EU will be doing much more than it already is. And, and also the response on the EU side doesn't need to be like for like. I mean, okay, investment guarantees are different from lending, but even so, there are other things that EU can be doing for economic and political influence. Uh, trade agreements, for one. Um, I think trade is one of the big missing pieces. Uh, it's also a means to promote uh, regulatory alignment, which is something the EU also wants to achieve. It will help with those trade and supply chains in key industries that are supposed to be a part of uh, the Global Gateway Initiative. But I think the problem here is that the EU seems to be taking a bit of an inward turn. It's very focused. It, it talks about open strategic autonomy, but a lot of the emphasis is on autonomy and supply chain security and protecting European firms from foreign competition, where the EU's more progressive regulatory policies potentially disadvantage them. So I think that means the EU is really missing out on a trade strategy that, that would help with its economic and political influence. The second thing I think it wants to achieve is leveling the playing field um, and ensuring that EU businesses aren't disadvantaged uh, against Chinese businesses. I don't think through the Global Gateway Initiative, it's directly dealing with the anti-competitive aspects of the BRI. Uh, and also France sets a bit of a bad example here because it pursues some of the same approaches that China does in terms of uh, financing projects that are awarded directly to specific French firms. So having said that, 
it would have been very easy for the EU to go down a similar route to China in terms of its model for a global gateway, and it hasn't done that. Investment guarantees are a fairer way, and it preserves EU rules and norms a lot more strongly. And also, I think it's a way of working which might work better now than it has in the past. Previously, a lot of governments in, for example, Africa, South Asia, uh, wanted to ensure they owned their infrastructure. And so they're in favor of loans, but then they could use for turnkey uh, infrastructure projects. So a contractor builds it and then hands it over. The problem with that is that you rack up large debts. After the pandemic, I think governments may be less inclined to take loans and much more in favor of uh, public-private partnerships. And they've been calling for some years for more investment from China instead of loans. So. I, actually, I think the Global Gateway Partnership potentially works, works quite well here. Uh, thirdly, I think the third thing the EU wants to achieve in, um, through its economic cooperation is to be more of a regulatory superpower. Um, the EU is pretty convinced that other countries should align with EU norms and standards. Uh, that's partly through self-interest and about protecting European firms from being undercut, but it's it's also a, a bit of a matter of, shall we say, um, political arrogance. Uh, there was a, an EU Central Asia Forum a couple of weeks ago in which the e uh, European Commission President and the uh, EU Commissioner for Trade spoke. And the Commissioner for Trade said, use the experience of the EU, put in place similar regulations and everyone will know that your products and services are fit for export. The EU body of regulation carries more weight and credibility than any other in the world. Central Asian countries should seriously consider approximation with EU regulation. I think this is a difficult one for the uh, EU to achieve. <laughs> and as Maya said, um, we need to be cooperating with countries that have different regulatory frameworks and more accommodative towards those, looking perhaps for more, more equivalents or more progressive alignment on standards, but I think the EU's demands are perhaps a little too strong in this area. And finally, uh, going back to the point that BRI has effectively been a vehicle for China's industrial strategy, I think the EU might also look to use its economic cooperation with the rest of the world to support its own industrial strategy a bit better. Terazawa san spoke earlier about how targeted the Japanese response was, focusing on key sectors. Uh, and I think the EU needs to think perhaps a little bit more carefully about how it targets its economic cooperation with other countries to also serve its own industrial uh, strategies. Just because China is doing something doesn't mean you need to do it as well. But as uh, to, as Arasan mentioned, just because China's building a road doesn't mean that European companies need to build a road. Actually, perhaps focus on uh, the things that matter more to Europe domestically. Great. Well, thank you all very, very much. And it's now time. We have about 20 minutes uh, to go to the floor. I have a question uh, online here that I'd like to pose to Terazawa san, and, and that is, uh, has the ability of countries in Southeast Asia uh, to borrow for better, more sustainable infrastructure been compromised by the fact they are now holding very, very large sums of uh, debt from China? Well, um... I, I think it depends on countries. Um, we have you, uh, can you, we can't hear you, Tara uh, You can you, can't hear me? Um, it is, do you hear me? You can't? Hold for one moment. Uh, do you hear me? We've lost your sound here. Okay. Um, um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll come back. Okay. Let me hold hmm. this for a moment. Questions here. One and two. Yes. Uh, please. 
Okay. Identify yourself, if you will. Sure. Um, Rob Mogulnicki. I'm a senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute and an adjunct professor at Georgetown University, I'm teaching a course on China Middle East relations there. Um, thank you all for your for your insights today. A very interesting discussion. One area that we didn't discuss very much today um, is precisely the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, I know this makes some sense because the region is not a main focus of the BRI, maybe beyond the Suez Canal and some ports so related to economic corridors. But to uh, Maya's point, there is a lot of Digital Silk Road related initiatives going on. Um, and regional governments are very eager to brand any economic cooperation with China as BRI or DSR related. So I guess I'd be very curious uh, to hear each of you comment um, on what the UK and uh, EU position is, uh, American position, even uh, a Japanese position on China, uh, China's BRI and DSR related uh, activities in the Middle East and North Africa. Thank you. Great, and let me take a second question and then I'll go back to our, our speakers. Yes, thank you, Edward F. Retired State Department Visiting Fellow at Stanford. Um, I gather there's no an Arctic component to the BRI. It, it's always struck me that it was a bit of a stretch for China to claim to be an Arctic state. But I mean, the key players there are the US, Russia, China, uh, Canada, Denmark and Norway. Those don't strike me as countries that need help, especially not from China. So what is going on up there? So two good regional questions, one in the Middle East and one on the Arctic. Uh, and let me uh, turn to David first. OK, sure. I mean, I, I think that the digital component um, is interesting in the Middle East. I mean, Huawei is, is heavily involved in Saudi Arabia and the Vision 2030. I believe Huawei is also involved uh, in, the UAE, in the UAE. And the interesting thing to me is that the US has put so much pressure on its NATO allies to not use Huawei um, and has really emphasized um, the security risks of using Huawei and the potential that it would uh, force the United States to do less with those partners in terms of intelligence sharing or other um, security activities. But I haven't seen the same pressure put on its Middle Eastern partners. And to me, that's, that's interesting um, because I do think that the, those countries that I just mentioned are some of the most forward leaning on, on Huawei. Um, so I think that you're right. I mean, you know, after the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan as well, there was a lot of talk that China would move in and fill that void with BRI. Um, and I think that China likes to play up that narrative a lot, but I don't see that happening. Um, I think that we're going to hear a lot of talk from Chinese officials that they are going to go into Afghanistan and really go, you know, go at it with investments. And maybe we'll hear a, a large kind of top line number, but I doubt it'll actually materialize. And so I think that when looking at a region like the Middle East in particular, and by the way, we also saw that um, with Iran, right? The, the China came in, announced all these investments, and then it didn't materialize. So I think when looking at the Middle East and Central Asia, um, it's important to kind of disaggregate Chinese pledges and what we see with the actual follow-up, because when I was looking at, um, at BRI in the region, uh, a lot of it did not materialize. Um, so I guess that's just what I would say on that. No, absolutely. That's a really important point that, that uh, what's committed and what's undertaken are two very, very different things. Nicholas. <clears throat> I'll start on the Arctic, which you're right, is really interesting. Um, the, the main partner to uh, China in the Arctic has been Russia. Uh, and Russia was in a position where it needed Chinese assistance, not necessarily technically, uh, but in terms of financing. Uh, for uh, So looking back to uh, 2014, and in the wake of uh, the uh, Russian uh, activities, invasion uh, of Ukraine, uh, particularly of Crimea, uh, there were, of course, big US and EU sanctions. This really constrained the uh, Russian oil and gas companies' access to international finance. 
and they turned uh, to China. So in part, they turned uh, to China for a, a um, sale and purchase agreement, power purchasing agreement uh, for gas, and that provided some of the funding to build pipelines, and they also turned to China for some investments. The big Arctic project has been, uh, it's, it's called Yamal uh, LNG, it's a um, it's a, a gas exploration project and a port on the Arctic. Uh, and China is a stakeholder, I think has about 25% 25, 25 stake in that project. Uh, and so that the, the part of the aim of Yamal LNG is to uh, produce gas that can then be exported to China. And some of that gas is exported uh, via Arctic shipping routes. The ambition is also for, to open up the Arctic as a shipping route more generally. And China has expressed some interest in other uh, Arctic projects. Russia, however, is a little bit more skeptical about uh, the extent of China's involvement in the Arctic. And I can't remember, I think it was last year, Russia, in fact, uh, um, arrested and imprisoned a Russian scientist for spying for China. Uh, it's also blocked a, a couple of subsequent projects. So China has some involvement. The Arctic um, or the Polar Silk Road or the Arctic Silk Road has involved a little bit of activity, but how much more will depend on how reliant China, uh, Russia is on China for money, I think. On the Middle East, maybe I'll leave that uh, the DSR bit particularly to, to Maya. Maya. Yeah. I think there's an important disparity between you know, the Gulf states, uh, the wealthy states in, in the Middle East and, and the rest of the Middle East. Uh, there's some interest, obviously, in the Gulf states in collaborating with China, and uh, but that takes more of the form of investment, both brownfield and greenfield investment. And um, perhaps the, the biggest in that area is uh, the Silk Road Fund's very large investment in a subsidiary of Aqua Power, which is a uh, was a Saudi state owned company, it's still majority Saudi state owned, um, and they are in turn investing in a lot of very big projects in the region um, but it's china's involvement in the region has primarily been through the prism of uh, investment rather than through lending particularly in the gulf because there's there are other uh, sources of financing in the gulf uh, yeah I'll, I'll leave i'll leave the rest to, to mayor perhaps mayor thanks david excellent question on the middle east and indeed uh um, whoever asked the question, I can't well. see your face, unfortunately. Okay. okay. Can you hear me? We uh, we can no longer hear you, Maya. Uh, Tara Zalasan, let, let's see if you're back. Can you... Uh... Do you hear me? Yes. No. Okay. Okay. So... You, you don't hear me. Had a little bit of a technological challenge that puts you guys in the driver's seat here. You should not have done this to your colleagues. Uh, so, so just one, one little point on 5G in the Gulf. And, and I think that, that, that one, one reason the, the U.S. Um, is, um, takes a bit of a different approach is that, that the, the U.S. has an interest in uh, China's engagement in the Gulf being balanced between Iran uh, and the Gulf monarchies. So it's, it's uh, that, that, that you, you don't have the same kind of pressure there, because, partially because the U.S. does not want China to, to come in fully behind Iran rather than balancing between mm. Iran and uh, the Gulf monarchies. I have a question here uh, um, on, uh, does China, has China used BRI uh, and do you think they're, they're in a position to use BRI to leverage the spread of Chinese standards. So there's a lot of talk now about great power co competition at the level 
of rule and norm making. Uh, and, you know, A, has China done much of that? Do they have the capacity to, and how might the West respond? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, David, China, uh, it, China knows how important it is to invest in kind of the standard setting process, especially when we think about 5G and the digital Silk Road. And China has put a, a lot of effort in, uh, number one, you know, getting Chinese nationals to serve in a lot of these standard setting organizations. And um, number two, is, as we found when doing our research, it is made very clear that they are not kind of international civil servants, right? They are explicitly told by Beijing to put to to help advance China's agenda and policies in these standard setting organizations. And the United States for its part has largely kind of stepped aside and has not prioritized the, the standard setting process. So uh, this, is a, this is a huge issue, um, especially when thinking about the, the digital realm and, and 5G. And it's something that the United States needs to, um, needs to, needs to invest in. Um, and we have some recommendations in our report for doing so, like offering uh, tax credits, for instance, for uh, participating in international standard setting conferences. There are also restrictions that the United States places on the ability of its officials um, to attend conferences with certain sanctioned individuals, right? And so therefore they might run into issues with attending a conference that might have Huawei executives there. And so we have to think about ways where we don't kind of put ourselves into uh, a corner here that we can't attend important meetings just because certain Chinese individuals also happen to be um, in attendance. But I, I think my own understanding is that we're, we're finally, you know, we've assessed the problem. We've, we've assessed that this is something we need to pay attention to. And now we're starting to formulate a response to it. I don't have much to add uh, on the standard side, apart from uh, one, one thing to sort of uh, watch out for in terms of the BRI's impact on standards is uh, through China being a first mover. Uh, and if it is uh, the first there to uh, uh, provide technical expertise and the equipment for, uh, for example, smart cities or safe cities, uh, then there's a potential to begin to lock in the, the Chinese way of working. So there is a need for uh, if they want to respond in this way for the US and the EU and, and, and Japan and others to attempt to be the, the, the first in, right? To match that first mover advantage, or at least to have some uh, discussions with uh, recipient countries uh, at the early stage before they make big investments. So one final question from me to each of you. Um, so Chinese um, new commitments under the BRI have, have diminished substantially. Uh, part of that obviously is COVID, but mm -hmm. uh, it began before COVID. Do you see that? What's your sense of, of where China is likely to take BRI? Because I do think there's a, a danger of resp in the West responding to something that 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 uh, was the case, but not necessarily is the case. Although most of the themes that that all of our speakers talked about would would make sense independent of what the answer to this question is. But I'm just I'm just curious, David, if you can go first, and then Nick, you'll have the last word. One minute, please. Sure. I mean, I think that it's really all about digital. I think that the Chinese are moving heavily into the digital Silk Road. Um, it's more cost effective for them. Uh, I think it's easier for them in terms of leveraging their capabilities to do that. And that's also, frankly, where they have uh, a comparative advantage if you look at something like 5G, where the US doesn't have an alternative. And so I think that you know David is right that BRI lending is down but I would caution uh, that BRI is not going anywhere, right? This remains Xi Jinping's signature foreign policy undertaking. If you read any Chinese readout um, from the foreign ministry, 
uh, they, they still are pushing BRI cooperation, BRI investment, wherever Wang Yi goes in Central Asia, South mm -hmm. Asia, it's about BRI cooperation. So um, I think the notion that China is going to just say, well, this was a good thought, but it failed. So let's move on. You know, that's not going to happen given Xi Jinping's centrality and that he's going to be the leader of China for the foreseeable future. So, you know, this is this is here to stay. I think that the Chinese are very smart about pivoting um, and they've now pivoted in the digital direction. And that's where our focus needs to be. Nicholas. Um, <clears throat> You know, the, the amount of financing for the Belt and Road Initiative has fluctuated quite a lot over the, what, so far, eight or so years of the initiative. Uh, and, and that's really driven in part by the financial constraints within China. And, and right now, there are financial constraints in China. There's a focus on uh, the financial security, the economic security of the country and, and the financial stability of many of its lenders. But also on the demand side, there's a degree of saturation with loans. So there will be, you know, it, it could be that uh, financing for the BRI picks up again in future as the domestic constraints on financing change uh, and as there's more appetite internationally, and particularly, as I said earlier, perhaps more on the investment side than on the lending side. I agree on you know, digital will be a big, remain a big focus, uh, but also I think um, with the climate, uh, with, with the climate transition, the green transition, now, China is the world's largest producer of, of solar um, technology. It's the one of the, if not the largest uh, producer of uh, wind turbine technology as well. <clears throat> Denmark and Germany are close by. So the, uh, investments internationally in those technologies, it would make a lot of sense for China to focus on those as well. Excellent. Let me see if we can get a final word from our two remote speakers. Maya, do you want to? Try here. Can you hear no. me now? No. Okay. No. Sorry. I apologize to 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 you, Maya, to Terazawa san. Uh, so let me thank all of all four of our speakers. Let me apologize for our technical challenges. Uh, we have uh, we have three forthcoming products from uh, Double I Double S. Uh, that that uh, will be coming out over the next several months related to BRI and the DSR. Uh, that that in in January we are going to roll out our China Connects data gathering uh, uh, project, which, which is really uh, tr tried to do a, a comprehensive uh, coverage of of uh, investments uh, and financing of projects in both BRI infrastructure uh, and in the Digital Silk Road. Uh, we have Maya, Nowens, and I have uh, completed uh, a, a, an edited volume on the DSR that is in final editorial review uh, now, and the Institute uh, is in the process of reviewing a strategic dossier uh, on the Belt and Road Initiative uh, that takes an in-depth look at BRI in all of the different global regions uh, where it has operated. So we will have all three of those uh, important pr projects coming out over the coming months. And with that, let me thank uh, David. Let me thank Nick. Terazawa son appears to, to be gone. Maya, uh, uh, particularly Terazawa son, for whom it's midnight in Tokyo. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we don't want to hold you up from your well deserved speech. Thanks, all of you, for coming. I think there are a few more pastries and some coffee left here. And with that, I will draw this session to a close.